Hello and welcome to the final episode of Business Standards, The Morning Show. Yes, you heard it right. This will be the last episode of The Morning Show, which brought you analysis of important news developments in the country and the world. The Morning Show may be going away, but stay tuned for more exciting and innovative video offerings from Business Standard in the future. Keep following us on business-standard.com or YouTube for more. My name is Venu Sandhu. Today is the 29th of February 2024 and here are the stories we will be sharing with you. Where does the buck stop after SC contempt notice to Patanjali? Can Blinkit challenge Amazon and Flipkart? Why did Vodafone's fundraise plan fail to enthuse D Street? And what is the carbon border adjustment mechanism? On Tuesday, the Supreme Court came down heavily on Patanjali Ayurveda for what it called misleading advertisements. The court restrained the yoga guru Ramdev controlled firm from advertising its products that claim to cure some diseases. The direction came on a petition filed by the Indian Medical Association. But where does the buck stop? And what is the way out? Shivam Tyagi finds out. The Supreme Court of India has issued contempt notice to Patanjali Ayurved and its managing director, Acharya Balakrishna, for disregarding the Apex Court's previous orders and persisting in spreading false and misleading claims about the efficacy of their products in curing diseases. Justices Hima Kohli and Ehsanuddin Amanullah temporarily prohibited Patanjali Ayurved from advertising products intended to cure diseases specified in the Drugs and Magic Remedies Act 1954. The Supreme Court had also issued notices to Patanjali Ayurved in August 2022 and in November 2023, warning of financial penalty of 1 crore rupees if misleading advertisements persisted. Senior advocate P.S. Patwalia, representing the Indian Medical Association, informed the top court that Ramdev, the founder of Patanjali, conducted a press conference a day after the SC hearing in November 2023, stating that treatment for blood pressure was a lie spread by allopathy. The case in the Apex Court was filed by the IMA, alleging that Patanjali Ayurved and its founder engaged in a smear campaign against the COVID-19 vaccination drive and modern medicine. The court has now directed the central government to submit a response outlining the steps taken under the Drugs and Magic Remedies Act with respect to Patanjali's advertisements. Justice Amanullah criticized the government for not taking action for two years despite the act's prohibition on misleading advertisements. However, additional Solicitor General K.M. Nataraj, appearing for the centre, argued that it was up to the states to take action under the act. So, where does the buck stop when regulating misleading advertising on drugs? One looks at the Drugs and Magical Remedies Act, the way the act has been structured. It is the local food and drugs administration in each state that has been given the responsibility to regulate and enforce the provisions of the act. So to your specific question, it is the local state government, or rather more, more particularly the Food and Drugs Administration, the FDA, that should be enforcing the act. The Drugs and Magic Remedies Act 1954 deals with the regulation of objectionable advertisements for 54 diseases that include common diseases such as diabetes, high or low blood pressure, heart diseases, among others. First-time violators, if convicted, could face a fine and a jail term of six months, while for subsequent violations, the jail term can be extended up to one year. However, experts maintain that the centre also bears some responsibility for regulation. There is a second provision in the Drugs and Cosmetics Act. It's called, it's Rule 106, which basically has a similar prohibition like the Drugs and Magic Remedies Act, where they prohibit drugs from being advertised as as being able to cure certain conditions. I think the list is smaller than the Drugs and Magic Remedies Act, but there is still a list. Now, under this this rule, even the central government drug inspectors can institute prosecutions. 
it's a different thing that we rarely ever see them doing that because these laws have been drafted so badly. Everyone just tends to enforce the Drugs and Magic Remedies Act, which is what the state drug inspectors do. So the short answer to your question is the central government could enforce this, uh, could prosecute Patanjali under Rule 106 if Patanjali was advertising any of those conditions which are listed in uh in Rule 106. Ayurvedic medicines are under the purview of Ayush Ministry in India. Pharmaceutical experts say that Ayush Industries promotion of herbal medicines has also been part of the problem. This issue has been, it's been in the news for a long time, I mean, not just in context of Patanjali, the entire Ayush industry has been making absurd claims for the last decade. You know, so until 2012-14, these guys would basically market themselves as like the nutraceutical industry does. You know, they would say that we are immunity boosting, we will improve your memory, we will improve your strength. Around 10 years ago, some of them started changing their tack, where they started advertising for specific medical conditions, especially, for example, diabetes, hypertension, because this is where the money is to be made in a country like India. And the issue blew up then. It went to a parliament, a parliamentary standing committee, took it up. They pushed the government. Then at that point in 2018, the, the Ministry of Health came out with a new rule. It's called Rule 170 in the Drugs and Cosmetics Rules, where Rule 170 basically created like a approval system for all advertisements by the Ayush industry. Now, that rule has never been enforced. So, what's the solution to unsubstantiated claims made by firms in the Ayurveda, Yoga and Naturopathy, Yunani, Siddha and Homeopathy or the Ayush industry? I think uh, if one has to look at are there more misleading advertisements or not so honest advertisements over Ayush products, then the answer to that is yes, absolutely. I think they are obviously trying trying to push through their sales. India is, while, while uh, India has always believed in Ayurveda, Yunani, Siddha, so therefore there is always takers for that form of medicine. So therefore misleading advertisements uh, are a good way to penetrate the market because they already have kind of a catchment consumer or you know prospective patients out there. To regulate Ayush drugs effectively, analysts argue that the Drugs and Magic Remedies Act of 1954 possesses adequate regulatory framework. However, the real issue lies in the enforcement capabilities of state governments. Currently, a gap persists in the implementation of the Act by state food and drug administrators. With careful regulation, false advertising can be significantly reduced, if not eradicated entirely. From the Supreme Court, let us now turn to see how firms are competing to make our lives better. Quick commerce platform Blinkit is stepping into the turf of e-commerce giants like Flipkart and Amazon. After groceries, vegetables, fruits and mid-range electronic gadgets, the Zomato-owned firm is looking to add a range of new products from various categories. So you would soon be able to get a new phone or maybe a laptop within 10 minutes of placing an order. But can Blinkit take on Flipkart and Amazon? Shivam Tyagi finds out. After tasting success in food delivery and later in quick commerce through Blinkit, Somato is now planning something more ambitious. It is reportedly venturing into the territory of Amazon and Flipkart. For this, Gurugram-based Blinkit is reportedly in talks with brand owners of various categories. The aim is to stock up inventories which will be delivered quickly, within minutes. This fast delivery gives Blinkit and other quick commerce firms an edge over Amazon and Blinkit. But to challenge the duopoly, these startups need to have a big stock. 
That's why Blinkit is diversifying into selling more products than just groceries on its platform. Currently, Blinkit is selling products under categories of groceries, beauty and personal care, and household essentials that subsume electronics. But the range of products is set to increase. Recently, Samsung teamed up with Blinkit to facilitate the delivery of its newly launched Galaxy S24 series in India. This partnership will assure delivery within less than 10 minutes in cities such as Delhi NCR, Bengaluru and Mumbai. But why is Blinkit diversifying into home essentials and electronics? Indian e-commerce segment in itself is growing at around 21-22%. Electronics and home appliances are growing even faster than that, uh, you know, about 25%. Now, considering that, you know, expansion of the segment itself, while maintaining their market share, adding more players into that ecosystem is not a big deal. Now, when Blinkit and everyone, uh, you know, when they started entering into this, they have an advantage. They are into quick commerce, they deliver in 10 minutes, or let's say 15 minutes, depending upon, you know, this, you know distance, but 7 to 10, 15 minutes is their target. Now, that's going to be a disruptor. 100% distant. Now, this is a very suitable strategy for them, basically because there's hardly any large players. Any ecosystem or let's say any large segment in India can afford to have at least four players because India is that huge, right? Beating analysts' estimates, Zomato reported a net profit of 138 crore rupees in the third quarter of FY24. Its revenues too increased to 3,288 crore rupees in Q3 FY24, which was a sharp jump of 69% year on year. And in this revenue, 19% was contributed by Blinkit. Its food delivery business, Zomato, contributed the maximum 51%, while the B2B business, Hyperpure's share, was 26%. So, with a large foothold in the delivery space, what synergies can the new venture offer for Zomato? I think uh, they're looking at leveraging some synergies. They're looking at uh, leveraging uh, scale issues. So I think one level they really want to look at is diversification across categories. Right? Given that the core of what uh, Zomato and Blinkit does is do delivery of goods and services. Uh, first food, then other services. They see this as a logical extension. I think the second area where there's a lot of value for them is really in terms of direct sourcing and inventory management. I think what they've done through cloud kitchens and you know, talking to large brands on the food front, I think they really want to extend this in terms of talking to large B2C brands and seeing whether they can become there for the effective last mile distribution partner. So I think that's the part where I'm told that they're you know, having conversations with brand owners at one level. Thirdly, as I understand, they're also working closely with ShipRocket, uh, you know, knowing the importance of robust logistics. Because now they're not no longer looking only at small food items or even groceries. Now they're looking at consumer durables, they're looking at electronics, they're looking at mobile handsets. So they will need, uh, you know, slightly differentiated uh, log uh, logistic support. And I'm told that they have a ShipRocket uh, Ship agreement in place. And then, of course, they'll further build on the warehouses. They already have a few warehouses uh, in place for their existing businesses. According to a report, the country's online retail market size is expected to reach $325 billion by 2030, up from $70 billion in 2022. This puts the sector's CAGR at 27%. This is largely due to the rapid expansion of e-commerce in Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities. Flipkart has a market share of 48% in e-commerce in India, while Amazon's market share is 26%, with Blinkit and other quick commerce players entering into electronics and home appliances, the competition is set to increase. So, can Blinkit take on Flipkart and Amazon? You should understand that they are of a larger, you know, segment. They have a larger market share in the space. They know how to, you know, place their product. So they are successful in everything else except for the disruptor, which is the quickness of the business that you know Zomato is going to bring in, and it's going to be hyper local, right? Now, if you can, you know, do that, if you can execute that, or let's say if you can identify companies, you know, revolving in that particular space, and then either partner with them or acquire them, then Flipkart and Amazon could also come into the picture, and they can become a you know true competition for Zomato. Now. As you should always know one more thing that you should always take into fact 
that Zomato is now becoming a front runner. Front runner, first mover in a quick e-commerce business for electronics and uh, you know um, home appliances business, right? Or let's say segment, right? There, the advantage is for anyone else to you know compete with them in the same you know level, they will take at least six months or nine months, depending upon how they strategize and then eventually implement. And that takes its own time. That nine months lead can actually make Zomato carve out their own part of you know the entire segment. Calling it a logical extension, industry insiders feel that the new foray by Zomato will help in its margin growth as consumer durables offer high prices and will not add much cost given its last mile delivery network. They also say that the e-commerce pie is big enough for new players and Zomato's quick commerce weapon will certainly make it a serious contender. But these quick commerce firms are also giving a tough time to the humble Kirana stores. These startups now account for 40 to 50% of all e-commerce sales of FMCG firms. Moving on, Vodafone Idea crashed up to 14% in the last session after its plan to raise Rs 45,000 crore prompted sharp selling in the counter. This comes after the stock had rallied 163% in the last one year in anticipation of a turnaround aided by fund infusion. But why did the fundraising announcement disappoint investors? Harshita Singh's report has the answer. Beleaguer Telco Vodafone Idea's recent 45,000 crore rupees fundraise announcement failed to enthuse Zalal Street with the stock crashing 14% intraday on February 27. The company plans to raise the said amount via equity and debt to expand its 4G coverage, roll out 5G network and improve its competitive positioning. Of this, 20,000 crore rupees are aimed to be raised via equity instruments by June this year. This also includes 2,000 crore rupee promoter funding promised in August last year. Meanwhile, its parent company and second largest shareholder, Vodafone PLC, is looking to sell its Italian business to Swisscom in an attempt to simplify the telecoms group. Investors back home were left disappointed as Vodafone Idea gave no details of new equity partners that the street was expecting. The plan was thus similar to previously passed resolutions that Vodafone has consistently failed to meet, analysts said. Vodafone's fundraise announcement appears very ambitious to us. So the company had attempted a fundraise of 250 billion in 2020 September. It couldn't raise the funds as the promoters didn't infuse enough capital and investors were jittery of the company's high leverage. In fact, the company, despite a tariff hike, despite more subscribers migrating to 4G, has similar revenues quarterly basis as it had in 2020 end. So we think that the company will struggle to raise the committed funds that its board meeting or board resolution has promised. Analysts at CLSA also note that Vodafone has been in talks with potential investors, but fundraising has remained elusive. Thus, they expected to face a financial crunch again in 2026 when its annual spectrum and AGR payments become due. Its annual obligation post the end of the government moratorium in FY26 would be 43,000 crore rupees against expected EBITDA of 8,400 crore rupees, which is a significant risk as per Motilal Oswal Financial Services. The significant cash needed to service debt leaves limited upside for equity holders. Given the current low EBITDA, servicing the debt without external funding will be challenging. The brokerage says. Vodafone as an investment is very risky given the high leverage, the low chance of them being able to raise funds and investors can instead stick to safer investment avenues like Bharti Airtel which has much lower balance sheet risks, is growing faster than Voda Idea and benefiting from its weak. Most brokerages have kept reduced and neutral ratings intact on the stock after the development with an average downside of 
Thus, a concrete layout of the planned fundraise from new investors and promoters will be washed out in coming months. Today, Dalal Street will eye global queues and the Q4 GDP data. He's making plans for an early retirement. Business Standard Huge debt is clearly casting a long shadow over Vodafone idea. Moving on, Indian steel and aluminum exporters are staring at tough times ahead as the European Union's carbon border adjustment mechanism has entered the transition phase. Beginning January 2026, when the new tax regime will come into force, select imports into the EU will face 20 to 35 percent tax. Abhijit Kumar has more. The Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism or CBAM is a policy tool of the European Union to address the issue of carbon leakage. It puts a fair price on the imported goods based on how much climate pollution was created making them. Thereby, it also aims to encourage cleaner industrial production in non-EU countries. Carbon Border Adjustment ensures that the carbon price of imports into the EU is equivalent to the carbon price of domestically produced goods, thereby safeguarding the EU's climate objectives. In other words, CBAM ensures that imported goods face similar carbon-related costs as domestically produced goods. It also incentivizes the exporting countries to implement robust climate policies by linking market access to carbon performance, thereby promoting global emission reductions. CBAM operates by calculating the carbon emissions embedded in imported goods, referred to as the carbon footprint. This calculation considers the emissions generated from raw material extraction to manufacturing and transportation. EU importers are required to buy carbon certificates equivalent to the emissions associated with their imported goods. If a country lacks a carbon pricing mechanism comparable to the CBAM, importers might face extra tariff or quotas as a form of adjustment. However, despite potential benefits, CBAM faces several concerns as it could exacerbate trade tensions, particularly if exporting countries perceive it as protectionist or discriminatory. Besides, implementing CBAM requires accurate measurement and verification of carbon emissions associated with imported goods, which often poses administrative and technical challenges. Critics argue that CBAM could disproportionately affect developing countries, potentially impeding their economic development and exacerbating global inequality. They believe it may also introduce new complexities to international relations, particularly between regions with varying environmental standards and carbon pricing mechanisms. While India and other nations may collaborate to oppose the European Union's CBAM within the WTO, it's unlikely to sway the EU as it aligns entirely with the WTO regulations. This move by the EU has the potential to adversely impact Indian exporters, particularly in sectors such as iron and steel, aluminium, electricity, hydrogen, fertilizers and cement. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Meanwhile, a study published by the Asian Development Bank has claimed that production in India may face tariffs to the tune of 10.5% value added tax once the carbon border adjustment mechanism comes into effect. This brings us to the end of the morning show's journey. We hope you enjoyed our reports. The show may be over, but we will continue bringing you insightful stories on our website, business-standard.com and on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel and keep following us for more. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.